one is going to be uh, killing uh, UAV. So there is a video I'm showing released by Raytheon. So this is the laser system uh, being uh, deployed. Of course, this is a commercial UAV. Uh, they, they may be targeting military UAVs. That is not shown. So this is the way. I think the one of the part of the UAV is burnt, and then the drone will fall down. So I think it is a destructive. This thing. A laser by DW system by other countries. Uh, there are uh, Russians, friends, French people, Germans, UK, Israel, China, and India have reported laser based DWs. India programs in laser based DW include. Uh, Demonstrated a range of two kilometers for anti-drones laser DW system. 100 kilowatt laser system Durga 2 is under development. Air defense laser dazzlers are dazzlers are also under development. These are being developed by Chess, which is a DRDO lab located in Hyderabad. So limitations of laser DWs. We have seen all advantages so far. So what are the limitations of uh, laser DWs? Line of sight. So as I told, it requires line of sight for the target. So it is range is limited atmospheric absorption scattering and turbulence so this will play a lot of uh, this thing a disturbance in the this thing suppose weather is not good so it is not all weather weapon we can say mm, thermal blooming that is laser threat continues firing in the same uh, exact direction for a certain amount of time as i told it may require five to 15 seconds to uh, to be focused on the target so the depending on the power of the laser the path of the atmosphere can get heated up, so disturbing the uh, uh, range of the target, uh, this thing or uh, weapon. So thermal blooming it is called. So that is one of the limitation. And the saturation attacks, HL weapons can attack only one target at a time because as I told you, five to fifteen seconds it requires focusing. So it requires several seconds to disable the target. So this places an upper limit on the ability of an individual laser to deal with saturation targets. So what it means is we may need multiple uh, systems to tackle with uh, multiple, uh, that is the swarm of, suppose we want to kill the swarm of drones. So we may need multiple uh, systems, but uh, it is having some limitations because of the space and all. So, and uh, hardening of targets. So there are ways of hardening or shielding. So that can uh, affect the range of the laser weapons. Okay, this is some of the limitations of the laser weapons. You can see HPM based DWs. We come to the HPM based DWs. So, origin of HPM, we can say EMP, electromagnetic pulse. It is a short burst of electromagnetic energy. At higher energy levels, EMP can cause damage to electronic equipment. So, type of EMPs we can see natural, like lightning. We, we can see when lightning is there, we observe, I think all of us might have observed, when lightning occurs, radio signals get affected. So, that is. That is the minimum effect what we can see. But energy as energy levels increase, a lot of things can happen. And man-made like nuclear, which is lethal, and high altitude nuclear, nuclear that is also lethal. That is a high altitude nuclear uh, this thing. And non-nuclear, uh, it is some somewhat non-lethal we can say because it is uh, generated with uh, controlled uh, power, uh, so it is non-lethal. So. NEMP is the abrupt pulse of electromagnetic radiation uh, resulting from a nuclear explosion. The, re the resulting rapidly ch changing electric fields and magnet fields may couple with the electrical and electronic system to produce damaging currents and voltage surges. So nuclear explosion not only uh, kills by particles, this, kill, uh, this can kill electronic equipment because electric fields are very, very high electric fields are generated. So detonated at an altitude of up to 30 kilometers, damaged by explosion and radiation. So this is the way in the nuclear uh, explosion uh, affects the, this thing. Uh, this is nuclear warhead demo, uh, detonated hundreds of kilometers above the Earth's surface is known as high altitude electromagnetic pulse device. Typically, the HEMP device produces uh, the EMP as its primary damage, damaging mechanism. Unlike the nuclear, for this, the primary mechanism is uh, EMP. The energy produced travels much longer distances compared to NEMP. Now, useful as an anti-ballistic missile, anti-satellite weapon. Only US and Russia has conducted such tests so far. 
uh, NNUP, non-nuclear electromagnetic pulse is a weapon generated electronic impulse without use of nuclear energy. Uh, devices that can achieve this is low inductance capacitor bank discharged into a, a single loop antenna, uh, a micro generator, explosively pumped flux compression sensors. So all these things fall under the category of HPM, what we are going to talk now. So if you see evaluation of uh, microwaves or HPM, so microwaves are generated by first by Hertz in 1880 and 1895 microwave transmission express by J.C. Bose and 1921 to say 1950 start up to 60s, lot of microwave devices like uh, Klystron, Magnetron, TWT, all these, I think this is the golden era for microwave tube uh, people. So many of the devices were invented during that uh, time and 1970s, there's a strong emergence of low power and compact solid state based microwave sources. So uh, then high power devices like BW, FEL, Virkater and Reflex were developed to generate gigawatts of power. So this is the 17 hours, this uh, work started and I, we can say this is the origin of microwave HPM work, high power microwave work and relatively magnet invented by uh, Beckfi and uh, uh, Russian Arjevsky. So Milo is invented by Clark. Reltran was developed by in the USA and developed with high power and the compact systems under development. Presently, we are having sources even that are delivering 20 gigawatts. That is the order of power that is uh, available now. Of course, in the laboratory, when the field aid systems, I don't think uh, so much, only maybe one to two gigawatts is being used at present. So need for non-lethal weapons, we can see evolution of conventional weapons. People started with using swords or maybe before that uh, uh, rocks. Then mature to rifles, then mature to rockets and bombs, now missiles, then nuclear weapons. But lethality of the weapons, if you see, it is increasing and reach now a stage where it can wipe out the human beings and the entire planet itself. So nuclear weapons, once you use, that is the end of the thing we cannot... We will, may not be there further to talk about it. So that's why people thought, okay, we, should, we need non-lethal weapons. Hence, awareness increases to realize non-lethal weapons. What are the examples of non-lethal weapons? That is tear gas, plastic bullets, high power microwaves, what we are talking is also a part of that, and low energy lasers, acoustic weapons, some of them are there. And properties of non-lethal weapons is conserve life, environmental friendly, and cost effective. Of course, the development costs are high, usage cost is low. So high power microwaves, we can say lasers, the frequency, the wavelength is the 0 0.1 to 100 micrometers and uh, microwaves 1 millimeter to 100 meters. Uh, and then the characteristics if we see, uh, that is microwaves, frequency may range from 1 to 300 giga gigahertz, peak force more than 100 megawatts. Of now, as I told, people are using systems with 2 gigawatts and future there are plans to use 20 gigawatts to increase the range and duty ratio minus 6 to minus 5 and pulse length 80 to 100 nanoseconds. Now systems are available even up to 300 nanoseconds. PRF single shot to 250 hertz. Now systems are going up to 500 hertz. And pulse energy greater than one kilojoule. Uh, applications of HPM, we can say not only direct energy, but there are other uh, uh, applications like enhanced radars and new radars. They are planning to use HPM high power uh, micro devices. Mine detection and clearing. Right control, that is active denial system, power beaming and pollution control, plasma heating, accelerator, accelerators, and material processing. These are some of the applications for high power microwaves. So major advantage of high power microwave DEW systems, as I told, I think this also attacks the target to speed of light and all other attacks. Uh, the micro, unless it's the density of rain is very high, it will not be affected by even uh, uh, moderate rain. Area coverage of multiple uh, for multiple targets, minimal prayer intervention of threat directions. That is, we can attack uh, multiple targets and also we don't need the information what type of system enemy is having. So there are HPM systems, there is ultraviolet band systems which can affect uh, multiple, uh, even without knowing the characteristic of the enemy. But narrow band HPM, we may need uh, to be more effective, we may need the characteristic of the enemy targets and surgical strike, so it can damage, disrupt, degrade at selected levels of combat and minimum collateral damage, that is why people will not get affected. 
simplified pointing and tracking like radar uh, tracking systems can be used for this and little sensitive to atmospheric conditions like fog rain unless like laser it will not be affected by atmospheric uh, conditions and low low operating cost of course development gas yes, i told development costs are very high but operating cost uh, once it is developed it becomes low so limitations of hpm system sir it is the uh, system is uh, less efficient i think uh, presently the system will be of the order of 10% efficiency uh, compactness for use in military platform has to be done i think the systems are more bulky now so compactness is one of the things people have to work on this and pulse width not more than 100 to as i told now there is going up to 300 nanoseconds and the rise time has to be less than 10 so they have to be improved and if you see the classification of hpm systems there are narrow band hpm systems frequency between 1 to 1 to 300 gigahertz as it will typically be 1 to 35 gigahertz with the mac more uh, practical use requires micro source to generate rf bandwidth about 10% of central frequency wide band and ultra wide band hpm systems does not need a source to generate hpm bandwidth is more than 10% of central frequency typically 300 megahertz to 3 gigahertz is it can cover the range in that area uh, hpm generation classification say i we can say uh, high power micro hpm time domain signal you can see the left is showing the time domain signal and frequency domain is bandwidth is coming very narrow and uh, it is a, is a pulse or burst of pulses of duration 30 to 200 nanosecond consisting of micro frequencies 1 to 5 gigahertz bandwidth uh, very narrow band uh, we, as we have discussed maybe even a single uh, band uh, the, the, uh, that is order of uh, but there are systems in the use presently l s c bands are up to c bands is used x band people are having some systems but still in the research stage and the ultra wide band the left one the figure shows the time domain and uh, frequency domain you can see is having a broad bandwidth uh, pulse width maybe 1 to 10 nanoseconds and then uh, uh, the prf we are having a little bit higher prf 100 hertz it is going the bandwidth is 50 megahertz to 2 gigahertz it is up to that point it is there having band with larger bandwidth so the components of narrow band hpm systems we can see there is a prime power source the maybe generator or battery pulse power system and hpm source and of course a mode converter based on the type of source we are using the antenna and it radiates to the target and components of a broadband uh, hpm weapon system include prime power supply dc dc converter mox generator tesla which are common to both and uh, pulse farming network only thing is there is no hpm source we can uh, after pulse farming network is directly connected to the hpm source uh, sorry antenna so coupling mechanism of HPM, we see uh, there are uh, two basic coupling mechanisms. One is direct coupling, other one is the indirect coupling. Direct coupling is uh, through uh, uh, sensors we can couple, radar antennas we can couple. So there are direct coupling mechanisms like front, and also it is called uh, it's a front door coupling uh, through antenna sensor as I told or five uh, receivers micro receivers uh, of course the frequency has to be in the receiving band then only it is effective otherwise it is out of the band rejection is more for the signal so it will not affect the things mm, similarly the backdoor coupling that is a, it can uh, go go through holes in the holes and joints in the say, uh, case uh, where the electronic system is uh, packaged and uh, resonant at approximately one to three gigahertz and protection shielding and filtering this is protection against backdoor coupling can do this so these are some of the coupling mechanisms we can see and uh, if you see the targets for hpm weapon systems uh, uh, say telecommunication system there is uh, we can see this mast with a lot of antennas so that can be attacked with the uh, hpm system and it sector uh, so the it infrastructures and uh, command control rooms and civilian radar systems national power grids all these are national transport system like railway systems all can be attacked by hpm and mass media like television and all these things also can be attacked and financial and banking systems the, so all these things can cripple the economy economical aspects of a country so we need not do any damage to the people and damage to the buildings also only system is totally collapsed by using hpm weapons
and uh, these are the platforms for military uh, these things see for example tags there is the headlamps it can couple through them also hatches it can couple of course uh, there are antennas on that it can couple through antennas and radar systems this is one of the radar systems that have windows headlamps and the antenna and similarly helicopter windows and uh, hatches it can couple through them so some hpm systems that are described in literature that is if we can say before 2018 and uh, see afterwards what are going to be coming into uh, future uh, these things see this is a uh, described by russia is called super high frequency weapon 3 to 30 gigahertz super high frequency means 3 to 30 gigahertz but they have not discussed what frequency there is of course none of the systems are, are describing what frequency they use uh, this weapon was uh, unveiled in the classified area of army 2015 expo in russia it is designed to knock out aircrafts drones guided missiles and any airborne high precision weapons that use electronics it creates an air exclusion zone within a reported radius of over 10 kilometers so what they're okay what they're claiming is a 10 kilometers range and the it is given you 360 uh, degree coverage this, this system puts close range air defense on a whole new level so this is what is the russian uh, thing that is being uh, reported so one of the latest things uh, what is available from russia and there is one more system uh, reported by russians is called rayanet c so intended to produce electrical lethal damage disruption or uh, dysfunction of hostile airborne systems uh, it uses in the x band 500 megahertz of power and pulse width is up to 20 nanoseconds prf is 500 hertz antenna gain is 40 to 45 db and weight is 5000 tons so these are the some of the system specifications so this is the uh, electric field strength that is generated uh, with respect to distance and uh, this is the other one reported uh, high power microwaves and laser defeat multiple drones during us army exercise march to the march 2018 us army has deployed uh, i think earlier i have shown the laser part of it now this is the microwave part of it they have done an experiment together this is called a phaser system so 45 unmanned aerial vehicles and drones fell out of the sky during a us army exercise after raytheon's advanced high power microwaves and laser during buggy engaged and destroyed them these common threats were knocked down during a microwave uh, maneuver fires integrated experiment at the us army fire center of excellence so this is a system and uh, Raytheon's high power micro system engaged multiple UAV swarms. So not only they have done individual attack and of individual uh, UAV, multiple swarms are also been uh, destroyed. Uh, two or three at a time they have done. Uh, Raytheon's high energy laser or HL system identified, tracked, engaged and killed 12 airborne maneuvering class 1 and class 2 UAVs and destroyed six stationary motor projects. Uh, this is what earlier I have shown in the video. Uh, the speed and low cost per engagement of direct energy is revolutionary in protecting our troops against drones, said Dr. Thomas Bissing, Raytheon Advanced Missile System Vice President. So we have spent decades pro perfecting the high power micro system, which may soon give our military a significant advantage during this uh, uh, proliferating threat. So this is what the US experts are. And this is the video showing how the HPM has been displayed, the phaser system has been used against drones so this is a video released for public use the u.s army fire centers of excellence now has the capability to integrate non-kinetic alongside kinetic effects the FCOE hosted a directed energy hardware investigation against two different types of unmanned aerial systems in September and October of 2013 at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. The objectives of this investigation were to engage real targets with a deployable directed energy system, attack more than one type of threat, engage multiple threats simultaneously, and kill these threats at operationally relevant ranges. Integral to the investigation was Phaser, a deployable high power microwave or HPM system, fully capable of organic or third party target queuing. Operators can choose system parameters to either disrupt or damage the target. The Phaser system employed was mounted in a 20 foot self contained trailer 
that included an internal diesel generator. Two different types of unmanned aerial systems were flown into the phaser system's main beam. Both a Sentinel radar and a close combat tactical radar were used to detect and track both UAS threats and were linked through a command view tactical, a modernized command and control system, and networked together by main gate radios. For this initial directed energy investigation, operators kept the phaser system focused on one particular spot in the sky. From 30 September through 3 October, the phaser system engaged and shot down two different types of UAS targets, a Tempest Tier 2 UAS and a Flanker Tier 1 UAS. Both engagements took place at the speed of light and target kill confirmation was immediate. The U.S. Army's Fire Centers of Excellence team has clearly demonstrated it has the capability to lead the Army and joint warfighters into the next generation of warfare. So the tactical hyper operation responder, it is called THOR. So the technology demonstrated, designed by AFRL as Air Force Research Laboratory, uh, proved short range counter US is having a short range and successfully completed two years test period and fitted in a 20 feet uh, standard container. So the, uh, the uh, participant uh, labs are AFRL base systems, leaders and versus these are the companies that participated in this research. And uh, there is one more system is called uh, Vigilant Eagle Airport Security System deployed by Raytheon. So this protect aircraft from uh, shoulder fired missiles. So uh, this is a system how it operates. So law enforcement is, uh, for other things, these are some of the civilian applications we can say. So deny access of vehicles to specific areas using non-lethal means. Uh, law enforcement is definitely non-lethal means of stopping vehicles in view of dangerous high-speed uh, chases. So this is a HPM can stop vehicles and uh, prevent people from entering uh, the, the secure, uh, critical areas. Uh, so this is a, a vehicle stopper system for law enforcement. It uses two megawatts HPM transmitter. Uh, it is having a very short range, of course, uh, because it's only two megawatts in the. So it has been practically used. This is the other one, narrow band HMA system for stopping vehicle. This is having a longer range. Only photo is available, no other data is available for this system. So one more thing is the mine neutralization. HBM can uh, neutralize the mines, buried mines also. Of course, a lot of research is required to find out what depth it can affect, what type of mines it can affect, whether it can affect the plastic mines or uh, other mines. So uh, work is required for this. Only just it is uh, reported by people that is being done, Bolke. And the uh, other one is the active denial system uh, developed by Raytheon. That is a, is a non-lethal weapon program designed to provide an option between shouting and shooting. That is, uh, instead of uh, shouting or uh, shooting, we can uh, radiate HPM at uh, say uh, 95 gigahertz. It can uh, penetrate only the top surface uh, skin and then uh, it will uh, induce heat. And the person uh, we cannot stand this for a long time and he has to be forced to run away from the beam so that's a crowd it is meant for crowd control basically these are some of the subsystems of the area system and the other program of hpm is the uh, airborne multi-shot hp weapon demonstration it is called a uh, uh, counter electronic high power microwave advanced missile project called sam program uh, it was tested in Ottawa 2012. It has been tested. A pre-programmed cruise missile has been proven to be capable of blasting out an EMP type microwave that was able to destroy personal computers and electrical systems inside a building over which it was flying. The cruise missile is equipped with a powerful magnetron that produces what I understand is about 500 megawatts power magnetron they have fitted. Uh, produces a gigawatt level pulse of microwave radiation. So experiments uh, done by Boeing Phantom Works team in the U.S. Air Force Research Laboratory. So this is the way the missile was flown over the buildings where the targeted buildings were located. These are the buildings that, and right, uh, left side uh, missile is flowing. And the right side you can see the computers were switched off. So this is a video showing how chamfer this is only animated videos, not actual video.
Though we can't show actual images of the CHAMP or Counter Electronics High Powered Microwave Advanced Missile Project, this animation shows a simulated weapon flying over selected targets, hitting them with high power radio wave bursts and defeating their electrical and data systems without causing injury or collateral damage. But it was no simulation Tuesday over the Utah Test and Training Range, where Boeing and the U.S. Air Force Research Laboratory's Directed Energy Directorate successfully flew the first fully operational CHAMP weapon. We hit every target we wanted to. We prosecuted everyone. Today we made science fiction science fact. This video, recorded during an earlier test, shows what CHAMP is capable of. Watch the computer screens in this office as the Directed Energy hits the building. While the computers were knocked out, there is no structural damage. Fade to black. When that computer went out, uh, when we fired, it actually took out the cameras as well. We took out everything on that. It was fantastic. Excellent team. Uh, I mean, like I said, the reason we are successful is due to the team and, and, and the team effort. A non-lethal weapon that can defeat targets without collateral damage is an idea that's been portrayed in television and film for decades. But this, says AFRL champ lead test engineer Peter Finlay, is no movie. We're not quite up to the place where the Star Trek and Star Wars movies are, but this is definitely an advancement in technology to be able to give us an opportunity to do things that we couldn't do before. James Dodd, vice president of Advanced Boeing Military Aircraft, says his team is focused on developing the innovation to protect U.S. troops. We know this has some capabilities and some impact. And so uh, we're really trying to engage the customer and see if there's a way that we could actually get this fielded and implemented sooner than later. After its first flight, the CHAMP missile flew to an undisclosed location on the test range and the flight was intentionally terminated. Boeing and AFRL teams are now analyzing the data and telemetry from this flight, which not only made history, but stands to change it as well. So other one, uh, the HBA system developed by B for Navy, this is the system, what is showing? but not much details are available about this system. Some research HPM systems based on DW, HPM based DW systems under development Air Force, that is, uh, uh, which are likely to be uh, fielded in the next few years. Uh, prototype development based on Thor is called uh, Major Nair. So this is what the uh, uh, upgradation of the Thor system they are planning. So many improvements like advances in capability, reliability, and manufacturing readiness to be incorporated in the system, uh, produce a large number economically, and a contract awarded to Leodos in February 22. Development of uh, two prototypes will be completed in two years at a cost of 26.9 million. This is a, uh, by 24, they are having to have the prototype for the advanced version of this uh, Thar system. And counter electric like, uh, power micro extended range air base defense uh, Chimera. So it is uh, going to have a longer range compared to Thor and Phaser. Uh, contract about Raytheon missiles and defense in October 2020. By 2023, prototypes will be available at a cost of uh, $20.6 million. Uh, some recent HPM based BW system under developed by Army uh, IFPC, high power microwave system. Uh, is a transportable container system, counter swarm of uh, the basic purpose is they are planning to attack the swarms as the target of this. Uh, uh, paired with IFC HEL as part of uh, layer defense, so it will be deployed along with the laser system as a pay, uh, layer defense to protect the fixed and semi fixed sites. So, prototype is to be ready by 2024. These are some of the information available on this. So, coming to the technologies of narrowband HPM systems. Say, so what are the vulnerability thresholds? So inversely proportional to size of the system. Suppose we have got a system. So if it is a bigger system, it is uh, more easily can be attacked because there will be a lot of, say, front door and back door coupling mechanism available to us. High for non-metallic enclosures. So vulnerability will be, if it is a non-metallic, micro can pass through easily. So it is a high for a non metallic enclosure. High at resonant frequencies of the enclosure. So the size of the container is known. We can calculate the resonant frequency and it can attack at that. If you attack at that frequency, it is more lethal. And wide band with narrow pulses are more effective. Uh, of course, the semiconductor devices, LSI, VLSI, microwave, IR detectors, ignition control, electronic control, and fuses of mesos or bombs digital systems, these are some of the things that are vulnerable. 
upset levels for electronic devices you can see type of device and power levels if you see op operation op amps only not 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 nine watts is enough to destroy disturb this or destroy this and ttl circuits not not eight watts see if you see all these things they require very small for power to affect but why we need gigawatts of power uh, because one is the range we as we want longer range so more power is required second one these devices are not available for us to attack freely they will be put in a container multiple containers container then one more sister container like that so the coupling becomes very difficult that's why we have to go through uh, as i told front door coupling or back door coupling so very small areas are available for us where we can couple that is the reason why we have to go for very high powers so how we generate a hpm i think we, i have already shown this uh, the pulse power source that is the uh, voltage currents are generated and electron beam and micro generation uh, is called hpm source like wir cutter milo magnetron relton these are the type of sources we are having and then micro radiating system antenna maybe parabolic reflector and a horn antenna is depending on the gain and then it propagates to atmosphere and targets that uh, it takes the target so what are the hpm uh, sources uh, that are used the conventional sources like magnetron klystron they are used for the laboratory type of uh, experiments we want to study and relativistic uh, devices like relativistic magnetron relativistic klystron bw fel and uh, carm these are the devices which generates very high powers of the order of uh, hundreds of megawatts uh, gyro devices gyrotron gyroklystron gyro bw Uh, particularly, the gyrotron used in the ADS system, active denial system for crowd control, and so it was as a wire cutter Milo. These are things uh, that also can generate gigawatts of power and used for HP maximums. And some of them are being already used in the field also. So, if you see the HP HPM state of the art, I, can, I think we can see at the S band, we are getting about 20 gigawatts. That the maximum power what we can see here, 20 gigawatts. Of course, in the laboratory stage there. But in the fillable stage, there are only two gigawatts are of the draft gigawatts being used. And comparison of various HPM sources, we see uh, uh, this is the frequency up to X band. We can say Virkator will be used. Milo also up to X band. So most of the devices we can see they are developed up to X band, except Jero device where Jerotron where it can go to 9 gigawatts. So other things are all being used up to X band only. Efficiency, we see, we can is the least of the efficient devices is only one to five percent. My, of course, now there are devices with the ten percent efficiency, and Milo up to ten to twenty percent people have achieved that, and Reltron thirty to forty percent uh, is one of the attractive devices. Whereas efficiency is concerned, and relativistic magnetron to magnetron twenty to thirty percent efficiency, BW also up to forty percent efficiency it can go, Jerotron also forty percent efficiency, and uh, extra magnetic is one of the. Yes, yeah, yes, sir. Barcata, virtual cathode oscillator. Ah, yes, sir, yes, sir. That is what is up to expand, and we can efficiency is up to five percent. Now they are available up to ten percent, sir. Okay, okay. Yes, sir. And one of the important things is some of the devices doesn't need magnetic field. That is attractive because we don't need any external power supply. Suppose it requires a magnetic field, we should have big magnetic power supply for the supporting the solenoid. So. Virkater, Milo, Reltron are attractive from that angle. They doesn't need any uh, magnetic field. Whereas the relativistic, relativistic magnetron, BW, and the gyro device, they require the magnetic field. And size is uh, compact. Uh, Virkater, Milo, Reltron are compact. Uh, of course, because of the magnetic field and uh, solenoid supply, other three devices are uh, bulky. And output power, we can get uh, about a gigawatt in Virkater, more than two gigawatts in Milo. About this, the uh, Reltron, even though the attractive is the power is limited by because of the construction of the device about 500 megawatts, and of uh, course, relativistic magnetron up to 1 gigawatt, BW also more than 1 gigawatt is available, gyro devices also up to 1 gigawatt is available, and construction complexity we see, Virkater is the simplest of the things. That's why anybody who is initiating the work in HPM, they start work with Virkater is the simplest of the devices. Of course, Milo is even the simple, but uh, working principle and uh, Getting powers are a little bit complex in that because they require high voltage, high currents, very high voltage and very high currents. And Reltron is also complex because of the design is complex. And other three, of course, are complex in the design and development. And spectral purity, 
one of the limitations of vircator even though is attractive from any counts uh, the spectral purity is uh, poor uh, other devices are good of course this is a simple construction simple vircator how it works so there is a cathode and uh, there is an anode mesh and a virtual camera because of the high voltage is virtual cathode formed that uh, electrons will oscillate between virtual cathode and the actual cathode and radiating the frequency the basic principle of this uh this is a way simulated uh, uh, this, i think a cst simulation has been used to get the power output from this uh, device one of the devices so as i told advantages for uh, vircator is a simple in design small dimensions and tunable radio frequency by anode cathode gap changing uh, we can change the frequency uh, operation without external magnetic fields and disadvantages poor efficiency and short to short variations there is power variation will occur short to short variation and multi mode competition also is one of the problems but in mtrdc with a lot of effort we are able to achieve short to short variations was not ever there at least up to 10 hertz we have 10 hertz frequency was seen there is not much variation from short to short that's what uh, achieved in mtrdc and this is the relativistic magnetron construction uh, of course this is a construction way similar to the conventional magnetron so this is the way magnetron how the electrons are flowing into the cavity and how they are traveling at uh, different electrons and with the different uh, magnetic fields how they are traveling it is showing and uh, this is a slot and cavity how the electric field is there available in the cavities and this is a cst simulation how mode is there and then how spoke formation is there and uh, advantages and disadvantages see magnetron very efficient device up to 40% also we can get efficiency small dimensions of cavity fixed radiation frequency and uh, radiating mode is clear but disadvantages operation with external magnetic fields very low rise time voltage pulse less than 10 nanoseconds and extra cooling required for multi shot operation this is the difficult part of it and the other device what uh, we are looking forward is the magnetically insulated line oscillator milo this is a slow wave device so there is a cavity at the center uh, sorry cathode at the center there is a slow wave structure at the uh, out, out, outer side of the envelope and then the initial stage there is current flows to the from cathode to the slow wave structure after crossing some critical current limit it becomes a self focusing device uh, thereby not requiring a focusing field this is a concept which is explained here and advantages of it is a very efficient device small dimensions tunable radio frequency and operation without external magnetic fields and disadvantage requires very high currents more than 50 kilo amperes because some of the current is used for the focusing of the beam that's why it requires very high current uh, very low rise time uh, pulse required for 10 nan less than 10 nan short to short variations are there Uh, non rating mode generation is also observed and here also with a lot of uh, work done we were in mtrdc we were able to get uh, reduce the short to uh, short variation drastically and the other the things are required for hpm work is the hpm diagnostics so we need we can use the once it is radiated we have to measure the power how much is radiated we can use a horn antenna with attenuated thing can uh, connected to cables and detectors and all oscilloscope we can connect and the other things are the we instead of horn antenna we can use a b dot and d dot sensor and we can measure the fields and also we in guide measurements like cal calorimetric measurements we can use these are the some of the requirements for using uh, uh, working in hpm area and uh, if you see the pulse power systems what it is doing is for uh, from a pulse of few seconds lower voltage high voltage with the lower pulse width it is being generated some of the things what we can are used for this uh, generation of this uh, this thing is the uh, voltage uh, high voltage narrow pulse is mark generator tesla transformer and fox compression generator so mark com mark generator and tesla transformer are basically the uh, electrical systems whereas the flux compression generator is a chemical system where a chemical energy is used to generate the electrical energy that's why it is uh, very compact so the block diagram of pulse power system if you see there is a charging power supply uh, and then after followed by energy storage device a pulse generator pulse shaper and fast switching network and 
HPM, that is the HPM generator with the HPM source. So prime power is uh, generated with battery and water, AC supply. High voltage AC supply up to 100 kV is uh, generated then. Then high voltage pulse generation is done and pulse compression is done and peaking uh, section is uh, there for uh, uh, interfacing between HPM source and the power supply system. So this is a black diagram of pulse power system where we can see from initial five kilowatts, one second pulse, we are generating 250 megawatts, 10 microsecond pulse. And finally, 12.5 gigawatts pulse with 100 nanoseconds pulse with is the generated. So these are some of the components of the system and how it is implemented. Bottom figure is showing that. So charging unit is there, MOX generator and followed by pulse farming line and HPM source. Uh, the other one is, the, as I told, false, uh, flux compression generator. I think this is one of the attractive things because if you use chemical energy, the system becomes very compact for use in airborne applications. So, so using this, they have developed an E-bomb. Uh, this is called electronic bomb E-bomb. It's a weapon that uses an intense electromagnetic field to create a brief pulse of energy that affects electronic circuitry without harming humans or buildings. The US Air Force has uh, hit Iraqi TV with an ex uh, experimental electromagnetic pulse device called the E-bomb in an attempt to knock off the uh, knock off uh, knock it off of the air and shut down Saddam Hussein's uh, propaganda machine. So CBS News correspondent David Martin reports. So this was reported by US uh, in the Iraqi war. So this is the system how where uh, it has been the configuration of this thing. So uh, MK84. Uh, this is called a bomb shell, MK84 shell. Uh, it is fitted with a uh, coaxial uh, vircator, uh, followed by uh, the vircator requires a voltage currents of the order of say 500 kV and uh, maybe a few kilo amperes, which is generated by a small, uh, we can see the back side of it is a flux compression generator, which is uh, a chemical energy, this thing, which generates the voltage. So this is uh, how uh, the chemical uh, uh, E-bomb works. Uh, figure below shows the lethal footprint for low F frequency and HP uh, HPM E-bombs. Uh, low frequency coverage area is more, coupling efficiency low and antenna size bigger. So no HPM source required to target. That is for the ultra bright band band. So without uh, Virkatra also E-bomb can be configured. Directly voltage can be coupled to the antenna where uh, we can affect the thing. That is the low frequency, what we are telling. Uh, coverage area is more, of course, because uh, the antenna, broadband antenna can be designed for that. And cover, but because of that, uh, this thing, coupling efficiency is low and antenna size is bigger. Uh, high frequency coverage is less, coupling efficiency is high, and the antenna is smaller in size. So HPM source required to generate RF. In this case, HPM source is required. So these two figures show what is the coverage area in the, both the cases. So we can see how the lethal area is calculated. Of course, this is not uh, very important for us uh, for the discussion. Uh, we can see how the area, lethal area, can be calculated for each of the uh, this thing. For example, a two point gigawatt source and the antenna gain of twelve dB at a height. If the E bomb is detonated at uh, two hundred meters high, if the beam width uh, of the antenna is uh, thirty degrees, we get electric field at the center is about twenty five kV. At the end of uh, edge of uh, say 200 meters, edge, we get about 4 kV per meter. That's the field generator. So, at what the type of antenna is used? Ready? Uh, what it is what a, type of antenna? It is a horn antenna used, type sir. Horn antenna. Horn antenna. They are using horn antenna. Horn. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, this is the scope for the future research. In my entire talk is targeted this only. Uh, the researcher should be. Uh, enthused by this talk, my talk. If some of them you start working in this area, my talk will be useful. So vulnerability studies of victim system. This is one of the things where a uh, lot of work is uh, there. Uh, identify the enemy system which are targeted, and the theoretical and experimental studies to find potential vulnerabilities. So the field levels required for damage, disrupt of in-band coupling, friend door coupling, or the field levels required for damage, disrupt for out, uh, out of band coupling, that is backdoor coupling. So why this is required is, uh, as I told, if you are using a broadband uh, HPM or ultra wideband HPM, 
uh, the enemy targets information is not known but the range of that system is very limited ultra wideband systems cannot give very high field at longer range maybe 1 km or maximum 2 km is the range where these ultra wideband systems can work so uh, finally for long ranges uh, i think battlefield requires long range weapons only up to 10 km is the target what we should do then ultra wideband systems cannot be used so we, we need narrow band systems then narrow band systems which work with only limited uh, there is front door or back door coupling so the knowledge of the enemy system is required so for that we have to identify first itself what is the target for our say enemy using say pakistan uses f16 aircraft so we should know the configuration of that details of that then we should work on what type of coupling is more useful what frequency is more useful that type of things are required to study and the theoretical studies are required because this is a process of uh, how hpm works is a stochastic process it is not directly uh, amenable to simulations a lot of work is required in this area so i think for research a lot of scope in this uh, in this area this study will help in deciding type of hgm to be deployed that is suppose once we know this data so enemy is having f16 i want to attack that so what frequency i have to use and what power i have to use that is known so similarly the cruise missile used by some country so what frequency that missile did, uh, characteristics are there so that information is known to be more effective weapon design and uh, this will cripple militaries and, and at also economic assets also can be crippled so we have to do these studies so a lot of scope is there for this that is vulnerability studies of victim systems and hardening of our own systems against hpm so what we are working our enemies also will be working in the same field so we have to harden our own systems so methods of hardening and technologies for hardening this is one of the important things and lot of scope uh, scope for uh, this area of work is also available and uh, specific platform requirements so airborne platforms say fighter aircrafts missile platforms airborne pods and all ground based vehicles shell setters naval ships so, so again each these are requirements require a different uh, approach to hbm system so we should know where we, which platform we are aiming at and accordingly we should decide what type of weapon we are developing and also by 2030 all developed countries plan to deploy hbm weapons to get range up to 10 kilometers for this following technical advancements are required there is marks generator what is the advancement required is reduce size of the marks generator and operate with higher prfs right now i think uh, we have got in the country maybe few heads of uh, prf only mtr is have reached maybe 100 heads of prf in a uh, uh, limited way so but we have to go to up to 500 heads prf so this is the marks generator requirement high prf marks generator but with a reduced size so this is one of the important things research area is there and of course hpm sources deliver higher powers at higher efficiencies so how to improve the efficiency of the sources and extend life of the cathode this is the important thing laboratory we can do something and the cathode goes bad will replace but in the field who will replace the cathode so life of the cathode has to be extended very limited information is available in this area and we are depending on cathodes of any uh, working capability we are depending on uh, outside sources this is one of the important area of research within the country required and uh, russians told we will give any technology not cathode that means that shows the importance of this technology so people should work in this area and power combining technology this is the going to be the future thing uh, instead of devising a de developing a single device which gives you 20 gigawatts or something power combining of two uh, few uh, sources uh, say 2 gigawatt sources i combine 10 sources or maybe 12 sources with the losses maybe it will give it a, so this gives more options for us power combining technology has to be developed how to do power combining without uh, losing the power this is an important area uh, increase the gain of uh, circularly polar and that is antennas coming to the antennas i think circularly polar is more effective we can see there are uh, two polarization one is vertical and horizontal so depending on the uh, say for example cruise missiles is coming in one direction with one speed and one angle and all so one polarization effective when the missile changes its uh, uh, direction the same polarization is not effective then our uh, hpm system for example we design with one polarization because the antenna will give only one polarization present antennas say parabolic antenna or r antenna and all 
so they will give one polarization so when the missile changes its uh, orientation or aircraft changes its orientation it will become less effective so if is the antenna is circularly polarized it will have more effective uh, it is very very effective but the present uh, circular antenna circularly polarized antenna has got very low gain so we have to increase the gain of the antenna to be more uh, useful for us and coming to the systems as i told the overall system efficiency right now is only 10% so we have to see how to improve the overall efficiency of the system Uh, and reliability of the systems is uh, of course very important unless it is reliable nobody will use it and reduce size weight and cost of, uh, this is for there for any system so i think with this i'll conclude my talk uh, any questions i will be able to answer thank you very much sir uh, participant any question uh, sir may i ask you one question sir yeah Hello, sir. Uh, this is Dr. Mitra from the organization in the in, uh, Institute in Chile. Okay. Are you audible, to you, sir? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so actually, uh, I was seeing some of the elemental things of your discussion, sir. One is uh, related to the direct direct energy weapons okay. systems and the phaser one. So in the case yeah. of the direct direct energy weapons, uh, it happens to be the beams are very directive in nature. Yeah. So uh, suppose uh, the enemy. Uh, aerial vehicles are coming from different directions yes so yes. Uh, that a direct uh, direct energy weapon has to scan all the horizon i mean 360 degree uh, exactly exactly yeah, you're right yes so for that system we need some kind of radiators for some kind of radars uh, in which some uh, radiating antennas are uh, you know uh, for covering that whole 360 degree exactly. sir my question is sir what kind of uh, antennas are generally used for those uh, kind of systems this is one sir and there is sir i have heard about uh, you know that uh, that uh, what is called that uh, i mean kilo ampere linear uh, injector thing that is okay. in short it's known as kali actually yes yes so heard that it is also using some pulse accelerator with one mega uh, electron volt of energy yes so sir uh, but but the thing is that since sometime i uh, got some document uh, while uh, you know while referring that yes. is particularly used x rays sir uh, would you like to highlight on this thing sir okay uh, first question uh, if you see the figures of what i have displayed of uh, for different systems most of them are using a uh, parabolic reflectors so that the antenna because the, right now the antenna that can give gain of 30 to 40 db is parabolic reflector so they are being used and also the radar system has to be integrated with the hvm system uh, to point the uh, beam to the target so all the see, these systems need a radar system also to point the beam to the target okay so and it has to rotate to 360 degrees of course uh, yeah if, of course yes yeah yes okay yes. so some of the things if you see the russian system what i have shown the first figure hpm first figure is the russian system the yes. entire uh, platform rotates the that uh, 20 ton platform will rotate to get the yes. rotation okay okay yeah. sir yeah and the next one sir uh, I, i was talking about that kali system uh, kali system sir, the basically yes. the kali system generates the high voltage high current to drive the micro source okay. okay so there is a micro source required so kali system generates high voltage high current uh, is the pulse power. we can say it's the sort of a pulse power system i think we have achieved in the bark uh, very high uh, megavolts of uh, voltage and the kilo amperes of current so that can be given to a uh, micro source to radiate the power so that is the kali okay. system this thing yes. and uh, of course any high voltage high current things generate x rays so you have to have protection against those things so what do we do na again uh, around the source we put uh, uh, lead sheets to prevent uh, radiation of x rays so that is the way x rays are prevented yeah. so sir microwave tubes are used as sources like uh, plystone magnetrons these are used yeah, for exactly air. exactly yes yeah yes okay sir okay sir thank you so much sir thank you so much uh, thank you so any other questions any other question i would like to explore yes sir something for the faculty uh, do you say drdo maybe mtrdc do you have any uh, any scope do you have any scope for for the faculty to get projects from 
I think uh, MTRDC in future is going to focus mainly on the HPM area, sir. A lot yes. of projects are being taken by MTRDC in the near future. A lot of scope for research uh, projects to be given to so, universities. So, I, I, I guess there are so many, par I just guess, there are so many experts in the area of antennas yes, in sir. academia. Yes, sir. Yeah. And the uh, college teachers may explore the possibility of as I was telling, sir, a lot of scope is there. And MTRDC is going to focus in the HPM area in future. So I think the main area of MTRDC is going to be HPM. So a lot of research work is there to be done. Yes, sir. Thanks, sir. Basu, sir, actually, I, I have been your student in Bardon University. I was fortunate to get you there. You and Rothro Ghatak, sir. So I got both uh, you there in Bardon University, sir. Yes, yes. yes. OK. But the one's university student, yes, I yes, that's right, sir. Yes, you were you were a student and you did work, you worked at Sayri Pilani. No, I, I, I was posted in that Baba Atomic Research Center where we are in, in the in the in the yeah. tenure of one year, so we have been developing the Skystone amplifier system. So, yes. okay, that is why you see you're in BRC, so you're talking about Kali, yes, yes, yes that is right. You see, this Kali is very much known to NTRDC and LRD, yes. you know. Anyway, I think none of the work of MTRDC is in public domain. I cannot talk more of, of that work. Even bark work also, I cannot talk more. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Dr. Dr. Ron. Dr. Yes, Ron, uh, Dr. Ron is, uh, I think, uh, father yeah, of the uh, Kali systems. Kali, yes, Dr. Ron. And he was very close to MTRDC. Yes. And uh, I'm very happy that uh, Dr. Reddy has responded to... So, Guptaji, uh, nice seeing you. Yeah, the request of uh, Sharif Pal at the instance of mine. In fact, I hinted. And Sir, Dr. I, I, I like to thank uh, Professor Basu and the uh, organizers for giving me an opportunity to talk about uh, my past work. Right now, I am not working in this area. Yes, uh, there are some, there are some areas which, which he cannot disclose here. I know. That. Yes, I think many things. I think he MDR is nothing is in public he, domain, he, so he, we cannot talk. He, his, yes, his work is. I am just declaring that he uh, his work is based only on the on published uh, work of on the published document and uh, this is important to know uh, he hasn't said anything about what mtrdc is doing so uh, mtrdc is doing something so we, we cannot tell that not any other persons going to mtrdc can uh, can mention that but uh, definitely you have given a very big, very broad picture of what uh, uh, you know uh, what is that directed directed energy weapon dew you get a broad picture, very broad picture, and the and the faculty can get something out of it. You have you have also said what are the future trends? Yes, and yeah. antenna is certainly. You see, when you talk about uh, the systems like say active denial system, the, the antenna for active denial system, they can, one can do a lot of research on easily yes, yes, yes. In, in in colleges. Okay, and the. Uh, Mostly they do work on they do work on microstrip antennas. Yeah. So perhaps for active denial system, also one can think of using microstrip antennas. Not only the uh, horn and so on. Yeah, that, some research is going on, sir, in that direction. Yes, sir, yes. Yeah. So I think these are the areas where yeah. faculty can look into and interact. And uh, another point, MTech students can do probably project work. Yes, sir. Yeah, at yeah. MTRDC. No, MTRDC regularly supports MTech students to do projects in MTRDC. Yes, yes. yes. As, as does Siri Pilani. Yes, I know that. But this is the thing I must tell you. And the faculty may explore this thing. Uh, uh, and Dr. Reddy can help you. Thank you, Dr. Mm -hmm. Reddy. Thank, Thank you, sir. Much. Thank you very much. Yes. I can, yes, I can see Hari. Yes, Hari I'm Mata, I can see. Very much here. The, yes, perhaps a good is here. And I, uh, if there are no questions, I think Deep, Deepta. Sir, should Deep, I start? Uh, yes, I think we yes, uh, yes, have time. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Reddy, for your valuable time and such an informative speech. 
now our next uh, speaker is professor dr hari mohan gupta professor hari mohan gupta received be in electronics and communications from university of roorkee now it is iit roorkee mtech in electronics and electrical communication engineering from iit kharagpur and phd in electrical engineering information and communication system major from iit kanpur he joined the department of electrical engineering at iit delhi in 1973 where he became a professor in 1986 he held emeritus professor and chair professorship positions at iit delhi he has been dean undergraduate studies and head of the department he was the founding coordinating head of bharti school of telecommunication technology and management at iit delhi the first industrial sponsored school at iit delhi professor gupta held full time faculty positions at magrahil university montreal canada great <laughs> university philadelphia us he has been summer visiting professor at university of maryland college park usa mit cambridge usa swiss federal institute of technology lesson switzerland helsinki university of technology finland ssk university south korea and several british universities he was recognized with distinguished professional engineer at 13th national convention of computer engineers in 1998 and as eminent engineer by institution of engineers in 2012 currently he is holding adjacent professional position at indian institute of technology jammu iit jodhpur indian institute of information technology and management gwalior his academic and research interests are computer communication networks mobile computing and networks multimedia information processing and photonic information systems and networks he is a fellow of institution of communication engineers and information technologies fellow of institution of electronics and telecommunication engineers fellow of institution of engineers and fellow of computer society of india he has been the council member of iete vice president of systems society of india chairman of data communication division of csi president of information and communication division of indian science congress association and a founder member of association for security of information systems he was india's representative in international federation for information processing committee on communications currently he is president of institution of communication engineers and information technologies he has been a member of the board of governors of iit delhi he served on many committees including year net establishment committee net networking committee of national mission of education through ict sir will deliver his talk today on quality of service in wlands welcome sir okay so shall i start sure sir okay fine first of all i should be audible to everyone I hope that I am audible to everyone. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, that's very good. So, thanks very much for introduction, and I am really happy to participate in the this faculty development program, which has covered so many dimensions. And today, I am going to talk about the quality of service in wireless local area networks. It would be a kind of a explanation of standard and why those standards have come what are their shortcomings what needs to be done what are the newer proposals what are achievable what are not achievable these are the kind of things i am trying to discuss today if there are any question at any point of a time i would be happy to answer them to the best of my ability so with this i think i can start my presentation is it fine 
Is it okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's fine. Is this visible? Yes, sir, visible. Oh, very good. Excellent. So, my presentation would be a slideshow mode. Pardon? Slideshow mode? Slideshow? Is it slideshow? Yes, it's yeah. slideshow. Yes, slideshow. It's a slideshow. Yeah, now it is okay. Okay. And at certain point of a time, if I need to write, I will change it to some other format. Okay. Okay, that's fine. So quality of service in W lines is the topic today. And I think that I have about an hour to speak, I believe. Is it right? Yes, sir. OK. So this is organized in four parts. The first part is introduction and a bit of history here, which I'm going to talk about. See, the W lines growth is essentially parallel to the growth of mobile computing. Mobile computing was conceived somewhere around 1989 by Mark Wieser, and almost around the same time, the WLANs started developing. Now, essentially, even if we talk about WLAN, even before 1990, there were some seedings in 1985. People have started showing that they can do, they can create the wireless local area networks. The proposal was, the first proposal was CSMACA, Carrier Sense Multiple Access Collision Avoidance. Now, I hope that everybody understand what do we mean by collision avoidance. I hope so. Is it fine? Can I assume that everybody knows yes. collision avoidance? Yes, combination between knows. Or shall I tell very quickly? Can I tell very quickly or if you, if you know, then I can go ahead. Anyone? Can I go ahead? I think you can go ahead. Okay, fine. So what really happened that the channel can be accessed in a random access mode, okay, in which anybody who has the packet or the information frame, they can fire into the system. And if it is a random access, the two persons or two stations, they collide, then it's a collision. And trying to avoid that collision is collision access, collision avoidance. In 1990, Khan proposed RTS and CTS that uh, request to send and clear to send control packets to be added there so that the hidden nodes can be included in that. That's a very well known kind of a thing. He gave the name MECA, medium access with collision avoidance. In 1994, Bhargavan proposed MACO, M -A -C -A -W, for wireless. Actually, even MACO was for wireless, but he added wireless additionally to make it MACO. Here, what he did was he proposed so called mild algorithm. Okay. What basically you're trying to tell that the somehow or the other, you give the information about the contention window to everyone. That's the kind of thing he tries to say. So multiplicative increase, linear decrease. That's the kind of thing, the window he did. Then in 802.11 working group was set up in 1993 by in USA. And the competing hyperland group was set in by HC in Europe, European Technology, Telecommunication Standard Institute in Europe. WLAN cars were introduced in the market around 1995, even before standards came. And IEEE and ETSI, they approved standard in 1997. So the marketplace cars came earlier than the standard. And essentially, in the market, there were 802.11 kind of products, which were proposed in 802.11 committee. So in the market, 802.11 products they won, and hyperlands were not accepted by the market. The deficiency of 802.11 standard was 
identified and then in 1998 so called power save mode was introduced then many flavors of ipple w land standards they came into picture initial years no attention on qos no quality of service attention was there and as we know random access does not allow hard guarantees on quality of service exactly the same logic that we have in aloha that when the packets they keep on colliding then there is no way you can say that i will not have large number of collisions it depends upon the traffic load on the system so therefore carrier sense multiple access is also a form of aloha transported in local area so therefore it can suffer infinite delays so there cannot be hard guarantees in 2002 ipple 82.11 e standard came and which was addressed to which was made to address quality of service in w wifi what we call wifi now 82.11 a or b standards so therefore that is the beginning of the qs show now there are four three definitions are there for qs one is the collective effect of service performances will determine the degree of satisfaction of a user that can be a definition here second definition could be guarantee a network makes to an application in terms of providing a certain contracted level of service through out of application session in fact the definition 2 that came by so called atm community atm is asynchronous transfer mode which was prevalent in 1989 to something like 2003 2004 and the many features of atm were taken by ip so ip of 1984 384 is not the same ip today ip is much different definition 3 it represents the measurable quantities for example transfer rate how long does the receiver have to wait for complete transmission error rate loss rate etc so all these things are three definitions are there and uh, somehow these definitions they affect what they call sla's service level agreement meaning thereby that if i want to run an application then i want to get some agreement with the network provider that this is the maximum amount of delay i can tolerate and they will provide or provide 90% time or 95% of time such kind of services of service guarantees we require performance attributes for quality of service these are service availability that is how long the service is available to us 90% time 20% time 60% time things like that delay how much in access delay just to acquire the channel capture the channel and how what is the amount i am taking in transmission of this data the total delay is one of the performance attributes delay variation jitter that's an important part that if there is a delay is being varied there then the applications may not run properly and in fact in order to take care of delay variations you have no other options but to buffer the uh, messages and then play it out that means that will have additional play out delay then the throughput how much throughput is required by the system or how much throughput is generated by the system okay and reliability like bit error rates packet loss rates and things like that they all should reflect in what we call the service level agreements any questions so far any questions please stop me any time if you have any question i assume no question okay okay then there are four kinds of pillar we call to achieve the uh network application one is the packet classification meaning thereby on some basis we classify the packets we say they are the high priority packets they are the low priority packets and things like that for example if i am speaking 
and there is a data transfer packet file transfer packet then my speech is the higher priority packet because it's a delay sensitive thing while it's not so much loss sensitive in the sense that if my 10% of his speech is randomly cut off i still couldn't be it could be understood that's the kind of thing so i have to give the priority then the isolation scheduling and policing meaning thereby certain packets i say i schedule in that particular time and also the policing in the sense that if somebody is loading the packet too much into the system then i should be able to stop that person from abuse that's the kind of another thing which we want in quality of service otherwise it will be denial of service then of course high resource utilization that even if the bandwidth or bitrate is available and i am not able to use that means my protocol is bad then the call admission on what basis i admit the call there could be a contractual situation that a, a kind of a user can ask for certain kind of a, a service a network can propose another kind of service and on that basis i will decide whether i will admit the call i will not admit the call and and then commit the resources so these are the four pillars and somehow these things they also reflect in w lens not all but some now this is a very a uh, simple picture which tells that w lens they sit at the edge basically and then you have the core wide area network which is there and even though we look at end to end service but we are here we are more concerned today we are more concerned about these edge networks that w lens now if we look at qs specifications then the matrix are there and policy there are two big divisions can be made so in the matrix it could be a security can be a kind of a matrix okay how secure my system is what is the performance what is the priority policies management policies and level of services those are the kind of things we can make so if you go in performance is a timeliness so it can be latency gitter and burst tolerance meaning thereby how many how much data i can send in the burst into the system that's the kind of thing i want to know because many a times i may not be allowed to put a burst of data in that case what we call the traffic shapers they came in come in operation meaning thereby the burst is flattened to certain extent then i should look at throughput ideal throughput is the linear throughput that's the ideal throughput whatever is the input that is the output but that never happens so therefore i have to look at the characteristics of the throughput and try to lift the characteristics to what we call the 45 degree curve 45 degree line then the accuracy whatever is being sent is understood or not and combinations thereof so here reliability is are there for example the accuracy we have reliability is are there just a minute uh so you have reliability here you have bandwidth here we are the kind of thing which we require you may consider them then the level of services are best effort guaranteed and with the controlled loads best of all basically means that i am giving you the resources resources are there in the system and whatever are available resources i will put the the, the data and give you the best of all services maybe 90% time i you are successful 10% time unsuccessful that could be best of all service guarantees could be there 99% guarantees or controlled loads that for given loads i can give you the service otherwise i cannot give you the service those kind of things are the qs specifications now we come to the basic 802.11 protocol it is basically the simple review persons have seen multiple times see you the standard defined so called basic service sets meaning thereby the stations are there and they can be connected in any fashion now let me just switch to the 
uh, next kind of a window so that i will stop this presentation and i can write it on other one okay Okay, we were here. Is it visible now? Please let me know. Yes, sir, visible, sir. Okay, good. That's right. So now I can write on this. So that's the thing I wanted to do. Now, these are the kind of thing. You have stations are there. Stations can be connected through access points. That is one part which is there. Other is they can be connected in any fashion. without access point so therefore you have what you call already many of you will know that these are the manets okay mobile ad hoc networks and these are the access point kind of a network scheduled access networks are there so there are the two basic networks are there and in this talk we are going to talk about the access point kind of a network even though i can still also define for manet also quality of service but i am confining to only access point kind of networks because they are more prevalent as far as the uh, wlan quality of service is concerned okay now the 802.11 has the medium access control protocol which has basically uh, this is your standard uh, data link layer layer in which up till this part is your mac protocol this is mac medium access control this is the logical link control kind of a part so we are i am going to confine myself largely to the mac part of it because llc basically would mean that it is some kind of a flow control kind of a situation which is taken care by llc now if you look here there are two kinds of things it has a so called dcf axis and the pcf axis so dcf is distributed coordination function okay which technically is available for the manet kind of a thing mobile ad hoc net network but if on the top of it you put the pcf point control function and this point is sitting in the access point there then you have the pcf axis so combination of that this combination here that will provide the quality of service that will provide the quality of service so pcf is made for so called uh, real time service okay and uh, this is for the delay sensitive service as we said real time services while this kind of a thing here this here this will be basically for web browsing file transport kind of a thing where you don't require the non real time performance okay now one of the thing which we say that everything is a contention based because dcf is contention based and on the top of it we are putting contention over the contention free service okay so as i said it is ca avoidance pollution avoidance right now if we look here and i come to the frame straight away this is my dcf part and this is a standard picture that if the source station is there it sends a control packet request to send and then there is a diff interval dcf interframe space interval and short interframe space gives there in the system so what you do that you put your rts then after that this rts is actually it is not shown here but rts is received here from this direction and then the cts is there control to clear to send and that is received here cts in this direction 
and then after short interframe space actually this will go up till here okay and this will go up till here okay so then you have cts and again you have a shifts here and then data comes from this point and then the acknowledgement is sent off from there other stations they create their own timers depending upon listening somebody listens rts it creates so called network allocation vector rts somebody listens cts it creates nab cts somebody listens data it creates nab data so this is actually what often we call virtual sensing virtual sensing and then the other stations they give a delay of diffs for collision avoidance purpose and run a contention window cw a back off window so in the back off window as many of us would know there is a min window cw min and cw max and at random i choose the certain back off so this much amount of back off after that back off i send my frame that is how i access the channel here that is the standard dcf procedure and we know that it has a randomness built in through this cw operation it never guarantees that collision will not happen collision can happen and therefore you can have very large delays also now what pcf does pcf picture is something like this the pcf is that pcf sits somewhere in access points so pcf sits here coordination sits here and then the other stations are sitting here so basically it is a kind of a this situation the pole on this side and data from this side so therefore pole data pole data that's the kind of situation so pcf is polling okay it is not csms ca in that sense so we can say that it's a kind of a scheduler so that is what i am saying i have not shown it here in fact here there is a thing called pifs pifs is pcf interframe space and pifs is lesser than diffs lesser than diffs lesser than diffs so therefore what the access point does it inserts a frame and this frame is called the beacon frame beacon frame that's the beginning but even to insert the beacon frame the access point has to win the right to send this beacon frame using pifs others are using diffs it is using pifs so it will get get preference it does not mean that collision cannot happen collision can still happen with the beacon frame with the other stations who are operating in diffs and then you have the kind of thing like the pole message from here and data from here then pole from here and data from this side now you will find that one pif is sitting here one pif is sitting here okay if and the data has come from this side here but it is not responded to if the data is not responded to the pole message is not responded to that means that the station has no data to transmit then the pcf inserts pips here again that kind of a thing and then once again send its pole and this message goes on until the end of the frame until the end of the uh, pole is over and last frame is that contention period begins and contention free period ends in fact this is my mistake it is the cfp okay and after that it is a contention free period contention period this period is contention period contention free period this is cfp period it is scheduling basically and this is contention period now we have noted i have said this here that it still it's a random access okay the access is channel on the random access basis okay this i have already said 
and interframe spaces is there there is a window back office there there is a window back office there okay think uh, mm. okay now the problems are there in the pcf problems are something like this problems are substantial delay at low load even if the load is not there in the system many stations are not active the polling is still to be done and therefore all the stations need to be polled so that time is wasted and if somebody is requiring high quality of service that will not be able to use okay then ap needs to content the channel at the beginning of the DC, using dcf and pcf both okay so when pips is there so therefore the effective contention period may vary in fact people often call this thing as for short end because until the time you get the access you cannot insert your beacon frame and therefore that time is gone it is difficult to manage the poll for large number of interactive streams without harming the applications using dcf contention the logic goes like this that this period is cfp contention free this period is contention period so here it is a dcf access here it is a pcf access so therefore if you occupy too much time in cfp here the cp period will be small so dcf access will be reduced that's what they are saying it's a centralized approach not distributed so location dependent errors can occur that depends upon the situation and that will affect the qos quality of service okay so it's a, actually it's a poor quality of service performance it's usually the round robin algorithm which cannot handle the various qos requirements okay and transmission time of the polled station is unknown meaning thereby some persons may have a very small frame to send some may have large frame to send and therefore the overall time will not be known what will be the time it is just an estimate okay so at most you can say it's the best of our service okay and a generic standard was required and is still under the condition that it's a shared medium so we come to the enhancement part the two enhancements are called edca that is enhanced dca and hcca we will come to that now 82.11 generated many standard and the first effort for quality of service was 82.11e that was the first effort okay the medium access controlled enhancement for qos quality of service the mechanisms are service differentiation admission control as i said and link adaptation now in the ieee 2.11e it is this service differentiation which basically means prioritization somehow you prioritize the new terminology has come into picture you have so called quality of service access points earlier you only you had access points now you have some quality of service access point and some quality of service stations meaning thereby in the whole station set you have these many stations are there and out of these stations maybe some of these stations like maybe these stations are quality of service stations qos stations qos stations rest may not require quality of service they also define a thing called hybrid coordinator right so they defined so called hybrid coordination function which runs in so called qap the the access point is sitting here the access point is now the qap access point that's the kind of thing some access point may not be qap access point so if you want to get service you have to get attached to qaps 
so qaps and qsts they are responsible for implementing the quality of service still it is a bit of contention based so you had two mechanisms were there one is enhanced distributed channel access what we call the edca and other is controlled channel access which we call the hcf controlled channel access okay. that is hybrid coordination function controlled channel access that is hcca we first look at edcf and we said that still you have to use the contention window we are saying still we are using contention window so the parameter to play with we can play the parameters as minimum contention window maximum contention window and aifs please note that in the access points you had kind of things like pifs you had kind of things like interframe spaces you had kind of things like diffs so now they say that additionally they introduced the thing called aifs the so called arbitration interframe spaces aifs okay which is actually the variable diffs depending upon the priorities so these are the parameters they played with and they came and then they also said they provide a thing called transmission opportunities meaning thereby the access point grants grants opportunity and then certain time is given and this is called tease off transmission opportunity and under that you can send your frame that is the kind of thing they try to do okay uh i think let me start uh, talking about edc itself okay now in edca they define the traffic kinds like background traffic the lowest priority the best effort traffic the video traffic and the voice which is the highest priority traffic reason being it say delay sensitive delay sensitive it supports eight priority values 0 to 7 and one user priority belongs to one access point but one ac can have more than one priorities that's a possibility is there now these kind of things they did so they this is simply numbering here access priority 3 2 1 and 0 and under access priority 3 you have user priority 1 2 and with background and then best effort is 0 3 those kind of things they have given these numbers right and they have defined the name the access uh, category as ac back background ac best effort ac video ac voice now what actually they did if you look at this picture what they did that internally they partitioned the station okay so it is station partition right and this station partition is actually the access point station partition so what you do is that you create the four queues there these four queues are created there four queues they created and for a each queue they define a certain contention window minimum and maximum and then aifs so three parameters were cw max cw min and then the aifs with changing these kind of cw min or cw max or aifs you can create priorities now okay obviously the minimum aifs will mean the the best priority that would mean this now this idea is not new this idea is not new in fact if the persons the networking person those who have done this they would remember a to 2.4 protocol now let me know that how many of anyone remembers a to 2.4 protocol 
anyone remembers 82.4 there were 802.3 uh, 4 and 5 these were the standards first given for lands token bin token bus it is token bus token bus 802.4 is for token bus sir yeah 802.3 is for ethernet token 802.3 is what for ethernet yeah 802.4 bus 802.5 is uh, token ring you can ring that's right so in it if you remember 802.4 in 802.4 in token bus also the station was partitioned if you recall okay so same kind of thing they did here same thing kind of a thing right because ultimately technology revisit or technique revisit so therefore same the token bus kind of a thing they applied here okay and then these parameters were created so this is again once again and now they also give certain transmission opportunity limits okay and each qsta implements own queues for each ac traffic from the queues the frame with the highest priority is sent if internal virtual collisions happens okay because virtual collisions can happen for example somebody's lower quality traffic is colliding with higher quality traffic then that is given back off that that is not allowed where the higher quality traffic is sent into the uh, sent out of the system served out of the system that is what they try to do okay and each acq works independent dcf sta uses its own back off parameters that is queues are not coupled in any fashion except at collision stage so these are some of the numbers they provided they say for access category 0 they will use the cw min and cw min cw max and cw max but aifs they will use two two slots okay while other aifs is given one slot remember that look at it this one slot so one slot means they are prioritized as compared to this okay then in the next one ac1 category you have same cw min cw max but afs changed to 1 in ac2 it is cw min plus 1 by 2 okay minus 1 and cw min is maintained here cw min plus 1 by 4 minus 1 okay cw min plus 1 by 2 minus 1 and this is maintained now please note that as soon as your contention window is small if cw is small that means you have more chances to transmit and in fact if this is situation this is unfair okay unfair so what you are trying to do by introducing a certain amount of unfairness you are trying to give priorities i mean that is what it happens if a certain uh, even in the queue if you find that some big vip comes there and he jumps the queue and comes in the first front so unfairness is there same thing here so these are the kind of thing they do you have diffs or if is sitting here depending upon the kind of traffic you have you have then busy medium after that again you put shifts or pips or diffs or aifs these value numbers and accordingly you put the contention windows and then accordingly you choose the back off slots and then goes to next play this is what the whole picture is as such uh, in the edca now this is simply telling you that uh, difs now becomes 2 into the slot times plus a shift time and so on so these are the kind of formulations of computing aifs in ac
as we said it does provide service differentiation by priority however qs guarantees cannot be given access is still contention based so once again no hard guarantees right and contention window deeply affects qs obviously the low contention window means you may have better quality of service okay what really happens that low priority traffic loads can degrade high priority traffic that's also a possibility there right now there is a something called uh, there is a block acknowledgement multiple sdv service data units see the max service data units without a bunch of x there is a group x now this is not a new concept this has been known from x25 days where what you have you have the frame 1 frame 2 and frame k and then you issue acknowledgement k which is acknowledgement for all of them so it's a implicit acknowledgement block acknowledgement but there is no direct link protocol you have to go through the access points you cannot have the ad hoc network kind of a situation where you can implement this even though our group here we try to do this okay then there is a suggested enhancements were there dynamically assign aifs guaranteeing minimum average throughput for an application class that is what they say guaranteeing minimum average even this word guarantee should also be taken with a pinch of salt because ultimately it's average frames with maximum transmission delay dmax are required to meet the throughput okay now for that purpose you have to determine the current status of the network which means that you have to estimate expected delay edi for the if to if traffic now remember that as soon as the expected value is there then a fair amount of statistics that comes into picture so there is a uncertainty and then choose maximum i such that dmax is greater than expected traffic in the i class for all i okay so it chooses the best and right priority to match users that's the claim but that claim can be met only a certain percentage of time okay then the hybrid coordination access it says that it will use polling as well as the random access both it will use both polling and random access okay so in pcf it was only polling but now it's a hybrid business it's a hybrid so therefore it will use both random access and polling okay now hcca will have the higher priority in edca whatever traffic which doesn't want to use the edca kind of a thing it may ask hcca to handle it okay hcca has full control over the wireless medium now when we want full control full control basically means both cfp and both cp contention period as well as contention free period in which we can schedule and in which we will have random access so it has full control on that if hc needs it it could take over the control of the medium by sending the qr cf call so it sends a particular kind of a frame and say that i am now controlling the cp part also that is the kind of thing which they gave they say that this will give you better quality of service okay hey. and this i think i have said now the picture is something like this now okay picture is this is a super frame here the beacon is inserted here 
the beacon is inserted here at this point of a time. And then what it does, it have a contention free period, which is technically, which is scheduler. Scheduler, scheduler here. And it is a contention period. So it can allow, actually, I should say, it is essentially the random access. It's essentially a random access. Okay. So therefore, what will happen that in contention free period, again, the same thing, CF poll and data, poll and data, poll and data. That's the situation. After that, for a certain amount of time, your EDCA data is there, in which you have all kinds of AIFS, you have the, the variable CW, min and max both, those kind of things, and then you have EDCA data. At certain point of a time, you require high quality of service. So then HCCF, it takes control, sends a poll frame and says, now you are under poll. Now under poll. Under poll. So therefore, it says that it can send both scheduled. Again, remember that it was a contention period. Here it was anyway scheduled access. Here it is a some kind of if you want to say it is a force scheduled. Force scheduled access. And then after some time it may release again and send, give the, in, uh, the, the control back to EDCAs. So therefore it's a hybrid. Once again, further hybrid of EDCA, the random access, these kind of a thing and controlled access. Uh, the results they show that this kind of a thing here, the this is a very high delay and this is a lower delay. So low uh, low priority traffic can suffer a very high delay there, and that is what the intention is also. Okay, now enhancement was suggested. It was called adaptive transmission opportunity polling that kind of a thing. And this can be shown in the picture itself, I think that's a better thing. The picture shows something like this. Earlier, the situation was something before that, this is the adaptive part. This is the adaptive part. Adaptive part. In adaptive part, non-adaptive part, you had the pole, a transmission opportunity. Now, this was the time given for transmission opportunity. But the frame length was this much. So this is what the wasted period. So these are the wasted period. This is the wasted period. This is the wasted period, and so on. And this is the wasted period. So such period could be waste period. And therefore, if you're wasting the period, you certainly you are reducing the efficiency of the system. So what is suggested was adaptive tease off. That if you are able to estimate the frame length, remember that the world is estimate the frame length like video frames. Okay, then you ask only for that much transmission opportunity. So you give the poll and only this much period is granted. Give the poll, this much period is given. Again, poll, this much period is given, then EDCA. And then this is the kind of a thing, which is a remainder. Remainder. Now this remainder, they say, they can be used. They can be used for some other purposes. That if the system says, it can simply give this to either EDCA or maybe simply DCF. Okay, kind of a thing. So therefore, it has this kind of adaptation possible. Now, the point here is, and an important point here is, that one has to know that how much is the frame length would be. For video frames, if you have recorded frames, you know. If your variable video frames are there, like in applications, running applications, real-time applications, you may not know it. So therefore, this is a guess kind of a thing. Any questions so far? Any questions? 
no i'll go ahead then there are some complementary proposals are there okay which are essentially taken from ip ip community okay not the wlan community ip community so one thing is they say the one of the proposal is persistent factor dcf pdcf so a traffic class is given a persistence factor p between 0 to 1 0 to 1 0 non persistent p persistent in back of stage a uniformly distributed random number r is generated if r is greater than p in the current time slot given no transmission occurs in the previous time slots okay in that case you simply send the packet throw the packet and that would mean that the back off interval is geometrically distributed with parameter p that's the kind of thing which they say now this is the kind of a thing you also look in the slotted alohas where the retransmission probability is also geometrically distributed the similar kind of operation they try to put here then there is a thing called distributed weight, weighted fair queue system so back off contention window of any traffic flow is adjusted based on the difference between the actual and expected throughputs so what you have actually you have multiple queues you have multiple queues which are there in every queue you look at the actual throughput and the expected throughputs you compute on some basis if actual throughput is less than expected throughput then decrease the contention window that means you can possibly get more priority that kind of a thing then they distributed fair scheduling differentiate the back off interval based on packet length now and traffic class so back off interval is inversely proportional to the some weight you give to the weight and the packet size okay weight is the weight for the ith flow low weight implies longer back off that means lower priority okay that kind of a thing so use some randomized factor to minimize the collision now remember that this randomness you cannot get rid of so therefore once again we say that if you have this kind of procedures you can come up to a certain extent but still you will have the not the guaranteed quality of service okay then the admission control this comes from the atm community which is now extinct okay so wireless node has no knowledge of the exact network conditions with contention based csma ca when with provision is almost impossible only soft qs can be given as i said in general admission control requires less modification than bandwidth reservation now what you do is this okay you do certain measurements you do certain measurements and try to see that how much time your channel is passive that is no traffic is there so no traffic no traffic indicates availability of channel no traffic indicate availability of channel now this you observe for certain amount of time and make an statistical decision right and then on that basis you probe the packet send a probe packet get its acknowledgement and if you get an acknowledgement you throw the packet inside it okay this is for measurement purpose okay then there are link adaptation is there link adaptation is essentially depending upon the physical layer the lowest layer okay 
this is to maximize the throughput under dynamical changing conditions meaning thereby fading variable attenuation those kind of situations or link failure link failure so they are dynamically changing situations and then you have to adapt so one thing could be switching transmission rate to the specified rate by plcp that is convergence layer and if you remember that many of the modems they have fallback rates that is if you are operating at x rate you come down to x by 2 or x by 4 that kind of a rate so the system then says that if you are facing the problems then come back to fallback rates the smaller rates okay then another thing adjust dss pseudo noise direct sequence spread spectrum like cdma so in cdma you have pn sequences pseudo noise sequences so in pseudo noise sequences you have this length kind of thing pseudo noise sequence okay so therefore what you do is this that as soon as you find a certain problems are there then adjust this length of pseudo noise sequence and please remember that if you are using pseudo noise sequences they need to be orthogonal if they are not orthogonal they are of no use so therefore they have to be smaller length and also orthogonal then you somehow not neither measure basically measure signal to noise ratio or carrier to interference ratio or both received power level average payload length which you have because you have a packet there you have a header and then you have a payload so you compute the payload average payload you have this kind of a thing transmission of x that how many times your acknowledgement has been received or combination of the above all these can be parameterized right and under the assumption that transmission power is fixed and there is a linear relationship between received signal strength and signal to noise ratio this can be a questionable situation also okay under that condition you adapt the rate and the rates will be specified by rss thresholds that is your received signal strength is there rss is there and then rss then will divided into multiple parts and depending upon the rss values you fix your rates that is what dynamical um, link adaptation is there okay then there could be success fail threshold transmitted frames they have x used as metric of channel conditions meaning thereby that if you have your transmitter and receiver you are sending the message here you are getting an acknowledgement here right so these conditions can be there and over the time you can find out the number of x which are received correctly acknowledgement received correctly because acknowledgement may fail depending upon the channel condition either your message is not gone or acknowledgement is not gone destroyed in the channel so there is a threshold s so the acknowledgements are more than s then transmission rate increased meaning thereby channel is behaving nicely and your quality of service will be better okay and x are used to indicate the transmission success failure that's what i am saying that you observe that acknowledgements the challenges are here in this whole system i have not described many many more proposals are there that in a 2.11 lens they are the most prevalent lens have been successfully applied in last mile technology where there is a need for wireless and mobile users in our homes also we have it is 2.11 lens there is an urgent demand for end to end quality of service guarantees wire come wireless and especially now that we have iot's 
internet of things so you have different kind of devices and you do require the guarantees so w lens people are trying to think or trying to give provide the framework in which they can provide guarantees service is expanding so new parametric set is there okay then we have to have a subjective test mean opinion score just like in voice of voice over ip meaning thereby the persons are here a b c d kind of a thing everybody is asked that what do you think the service is good or bad so opinion is there so you have to have the subjective test also not only objective test also and you have to satisfy both of them again the services are location and context dependent so therefore one has to modify the protocols depending upon the location and context then the computation versus communication load that is how much can you compute at your end in your terminals and how much you actually you want to float on to the communication channel you want to float on to the communication channel that means you are likely to have more delays okay if you want to compute at your end basically that means there is a limited amount of memory and applications at your end so all services cannot be computed and then there can be advanced resource reservation that even before your application is floated you can reserve the resources and then you say that since i have reserved the resources i have this much expected qos these are the kind of things which are the newer challenges so with this i finish and thanks very much for your kind attention if you have any comments observations please let me know and i will try to answer it any comments observations thank you very much sir uh, anybody any question does anybody have any question please any questions comment or observations anybody any question please does anybody have any question please ask okay there are no questions at all okay sir i have some question oh please please uh, sir you see uh, in real time communication zitter yeah. is a great problem yeah okay so especially when there is a congestion uh, no uh, there is zitter is a main problem it is it also affects the quality of service yes so to, to avoid zitter we generally adopt the buffering system okay yes uh, is there any other method to avoid zitter to get rid of zitter okay in fact uh, the question that you have asked is uh, very very uh, it has a wide ambit as such frankly speaking because uh, the congestion is tackled at multiple levels congestion is tackled at uh, mac level medium access control level it can be tackled at network level that is routing protocols and the transport level all of them yes sir hey all the three so one can not look at isolation as such okay now i can give you now one simple example for example if you go to the transport uh, level then you have a random early detection Yes, think thereby you make a queue and you start trying to probe by a probe kind of a situation that how much time it will take to reach your traffic your packet to the head of the queue before being served okay and if it is not then you destroy it or if you want you can throw a priority there those kind of things that is the transport layer kind of thing in the medium access kind of a situation Okay, if you want to look at congestion control kind of a thing, then you have no other devices other than your contention window kind of a thing. Okay, or SIFs, DIFs, and AIFS. These such combinations are there. Or else you can have at the routing cum MAC layer, routing cum MAC, I say. Okay, both the admission control, meaning thereby you somehow measure the congestion somehow. you measure that this is the kind of congestion you are facing and then you say that look for this kind of a thing i will not admit this connection 
this is what it is and once you admit the connection you can also give them contract the guarantees that 90% time i will make your packets through okay so the congestion is a distributed phenomenon it is not a, a single hop phenomenon or one one host phenomenon yes sir okay so this is what that's why the answer with the question that you asked is a very very wide ramification as it in the network and every day people are trying to for particular kind of applications people are trying to create the the new congestion avoidance or congestion mitigation kind of a uh, strategies is still there at various levels so another question is that when there is some congestion yeah uh, suppose that, uh, if there is some we can adopt uh, traffic shaping using say leaky bucket algorithm or uh, token bucket algorithm okay but sometimes we use uh, some uh, discard some packets using the, the early detection uh, random early detection method yes, for yes. load shedding yes so uh, i think it, uh, how does it affect the quality of service okay we go we will go for stop stop sharing okay stop sharing then we proceed stop sharing oh stop sharing okay fine fine that's yes, fine please please okay that's right okay see what really happens here what you what you say is there that uh, it depends upon the kind of traffic you are having i mean no give an example now supposing you are transmitting a video traffic then in video traffic your synchronization signals are extremely important signals okay if your synchronization signals they are destroyed then your quality of service is gone because even if you are buffering okay buffer is of no value because you cannot play it back right so therefore they you have to give the certain kind of priorities okay and these priorities they have to be handled they have to be handled with um, whatever the congestion is there so that is why if you remember there that in wireless networks you also have multifurcated routing not a single path routing multifurcated routing and then you have to immediately choose that for this kind of high priority traffic not only the mac level but also the routing level routing level you choose that path which has the lowest kind of a delay at that point of a time other traffic you can float anywhere you want so those kind of situations could be there i am not saying 100% correct 100% guarantee would be there but we will try to mitigate the situation is there any other question please thank you very much sir uh, for your uh, so much informative lecture and i'm sure that all the faculties who are teaching in the field of computer networks or computer communication they will be highly benefited from this uh, lecture and uh, definitely if the faculties can get a, in a clear conception i think the students will be also benefited and uh, not only that your lecture was so, so lucid that everybody can understand and i think i believe that even the students of the the biggest students of the good institute they can also understand your lecture it was really very good very nice and i think everybody enjoyed the lecture very much uh, thank, thank you very much sir and uh, this is this time we got you on online but in future we expect you to be present physically in our institute well fine i will be happy to visit okay and i hope that uh, kalakpur is not far off from durgapur so i can also visit kalakpur then Okay. okay. If, it, if the opportunity comes. Yes, sir. Definitely, sir. We shall. We shall. Uh, in future, we shall try to get you here. Okay. That will be. A, uh, we shall be very happy in that case, sir. Okay. So really, it was a Hello? nice. Hello. Yes, please. Sir. Sarit. Yes, sir. Ah. Yes. This is this is for Sarit Pal. Professor yes, sir. Sarit Pal. Yes. When you are arranging his visit, please arrange my visit too. <laughs> ah, definitely, sir. Yes. Definitely, sir. Whether I would visit your place. Definitely, so sir. So try to try try to see whether this could be done. Okay. Definitely, sir. A great friend of mine. Yes, yes. So, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I was a little fast that even though the techniques are there and fair amount of statistics is involved in that, so I have not gone into that. Okay. But then, um, in such a small time, one cannot go into those kind of things. Yes, sir.
anyway we are uh, very much benefited from your lecture sir oh that's fine uh, so happy no to doubt, know no doubt, no doubt. so to, yeah. the credit goes to me also to to so sir you, you suggested uh, <laughs> the new professor yeah to me contacted him so actually sir uh, the entire credit of the fdp should go to you because we have worked under your guidance only sir <laughs> no problem <laughs> okay okay so let us uh, call it a day Actually, uh, the my credit man, I give all the credit to my guru, Professor N. B. Chakraborty. Yes, yes, who, our common guru. Who taught our me to guru. look in different directions and yes. not to be cowed down by the problems. He is one of the important motto is, and he used to ask the questions: Is it the only way to solve the problem? Okay, can there be not be any other way? That is what the motto we was there. And that is what he has yes. inculcated in us that there can be yes. different ways in looking other than what is available there. Uh, what, so, uh, Professor Sarit Pal, yes, hello. Sir. Yes, sir. I would like to share that uh, I, 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 as you know, I am writing a, an autobiography in Bengali. Yes. And I have I, I have written a lot about Professor Gupta, Professor N. B. Chakravarti. Yeah, I know. Sir. Yes, yes. Okay, I am writing. I have already written. Some of the chapters. Thank you very much, Professor Gupta. Okay, so nice. Thank you. Thank you. I am happy Thank to be participating in this. Namaskar. Namaskar. Thank you very much, sir. Namaskar. So, uh, so now, now we are going to end today's session, and tomorrow yeah. we shall meet at uh, ten thirty a.m. for the uh, session one, morning session. And in the morning session, there will be uh, two lectures in in the field of medical electronics. Professor S K Kak and Dr P L Boshak will deliver their lectures in the first half, and in the second half. He is in half, USA. Yes, from sir? USA he will speak. Huh, from Professor S K Kak is in USA presently, but uh, he has agreed to, to give the lecture. He has given his consent uh, to give the lecture. Okay. And at the time, uh, I think in his place, that time will be around 11 p.m. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Anyway, okay. the, any, we are very happy to have him. I will try. I will try. Bye bye. Namaskar. Okay. okay. Namaskar. 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 Okay, sir. So, want to see you in the tomorrow in the morning session as well in the second hour session. Okay. Thank you, sir. Let us close the session.